good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're coming to us from. Welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I have on one of my favorites, Angela Coxon from Your Part-Time Controller. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks, Julia. It's great to be back. You know, Angela, one of the things I say about you and the folks on your team, which your team is growing by leaps and bounds, <laughs> but especially you, my friend, I always feel... Like I could ask you a question or I could say something and your hair's not going to catch on fire. You're not going to roll your eyes and you're not going to tell me to my face that I'm an idiot. <laughs> so, never. never. You not know, well, I have my moments, but you know, um, I think that's like one of the magical problems and opportunities of accounting. And what we're going to talk about today is like, mm -hmm how do we communicate about our numbers and we use the phrase you know storytelling or the word storytelling which it kind of gives me the ebgbs i'm like oh storytelling you know that's like is that good is that bad what do we do and so i'm really interested to hear what you're going to say and mm -hmm. how you're going to be able to help us because this is a big issue yeah, it really is. And storytelling, you know, it's it's not in a bad context. We're telling the story of the organization. We're talking about the things that the organization does for the benefit of its constituents, how they follow their mission. Um, but we're weaving it in a way that is easy for the reader to understand, to not get lost into the numbers. Um, because of course, you know, not everybody's an accountant. Not everybody loves numbers like I do. Um, so we want to make it it. Um, easy to understand and readable and um, visually appealing. And that's just part of the storytelling. Well, it's a new dawn in, in communication in so many ways. Um, we're using these tools, um, these visuals across our sector, across, across society. But to see it um, entering into the discussion of financials, that's what I find incredibly fascinating. So this is going to be a really, really good episode. You know, another thing that's really, really good is we have these amazing presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episode on Fridays just de dedicated to fundraising, and your part-time controller where Angela joins us from. We have this amazing group of co-hosts. I'm flying solo today with Angela. And again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Um, okay, Angela, before we get going, tell me what a regional director does. Oh, uh, so a regional director at, at your part-time controller, we uh, spread across the country very rapidly in um, starting in 2020 when the pandemic hit and we you know, were able to do things remotely. And we realized that we needed um, kind of almost an extra layer, some additional folks um, to help our market leaders to, to get done everything that they need to get done and make sure that we're doing all that we can for our clients. So we created the regional director position uh, myself. I am responsible for our remote services. So we have four uh, regional directors and um, we help to make sure that our uh, market leaders in the 13 markets that we have across the country um, are getting the best um, out of YPTC that they can. So you are probably traveling quite a bit and seeing what's cooking around the country, right? You're not just plunked down in one of the markets. <laughs> right. I actually don't. Um, I, well, I live outside of Philadelphia, so but I do travel um, a fair bit, kind of meeting our team, um, you know, lots of in-person meetings, but um, because we are so spread out within um, our remote services, we're literally all the way across the country. So Amazing. Well, it's been a joy to get to know you and learn from you. And um, we got a lot to talk about. So we need to like jump in. Okay. And first of all, storytelling, you know, it's kind of a loaded word, right? Because storytelling, we use it a lot in the nonprofit sector, but mm -hmm. then it's newly attached to financials. Talk to us about this. Yeah. So, I mean, similar to, you know, what we're, what we're telling a story about from a program and operations perspective, we want to do the same thing. 
um, when we're looking at the financial information for the organization, because we want to make sure we're we're getting our story across, and we're not we're not spinning a yarn in you know the the sense of a storytelling, but we want to make sure that we're getting our message across. Um, and the primary message here is how are we supporting the mission? So how are we using the financial resources of the organization to address the mission of the organization? And that's really the story that we want to tell uh, using the numbers. It's interesting. Um, it's simple, but it's complicated. And you kind of roped it back in when you're like, start with the mission, start with what it is you do. Mm -hmm. It seems to me um, it could be it can become overwhelming, like, oh, my God, how do I tell a story about numbers? But I loved what you said. If we start with back with what our mission is, then that seems like just the logical place to move mm -hmm. forward. Yeah, that's really the driver of the story that the organization is trying to tell. And, you know, each story is going to be a little bit different based on who um, the audience is for the story. Of course, you want it to be consistent if you're telling the story for the organization. You don't want to mislead people in any way. Um, right. But it's really going to be directed to, you know, who the reader of that story is mm -hmm. and making sure that it's relevant for them. But again, like you said, everything points back to the mission because that's what's really important with the nonprofit. Yeah, I, I love it. And, you know, I think sometimes we forget about that or that we think everybody knows, right? Because we know, but we got a 1.8 million nonprofits in this country. And there's a lot of, I don't want to say noise because that seems negative, but there's a lot of information brewing out there, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of moving that forward. Let's talk more about what the main components of the story would be yeah. um, in your mind. How do we frame this up? Yeah. So again, going back to the mission, that's, that's the starting point. We want to make sure that we are connecting to the mission. We want to identify what we're using the funds for within the organization and what are the programs that we're influencing? What, you know, who are the people that we are um, affecting? Um, with the resources of the organization. Um, and then we want to make sure that there's a compelling narrative. Um, so, you know, it's not just, again, numbers on a page because numbers are very dry, um, but we want to tell the story of the organization and the impact that the organization has. So, you know, incorporating some real life stories in there, some impacts of constituents or beneficiaries, um, you know, who who is seeing the benefit of what we're doing um, within the organization. And then of course, you know, we want to have some data visualization because Julia, I know that you love data visualization. I do. Um, I love it. <laughs> it is it well, Angela, listen, it changed my life in terms of being a steward um, within the nonprofit sector. Uh -huh. Because when I would sit in audit meetings or, you know, when the financials would be coming into a board meeting, uh, um, as they do, and you're expected mm -hmm. to understand, it's <laughs> changed when I started seeing more of these these visual representations. It yeah. just when I noticed, Angela, I got a witness to you. I noticed it changed for everybody else around that board table. Yeah, because it really brings things to light, and it makes yeah. it so much um, easier to understand. You know, for the board members, again, not every board member has a financial background. Not everybody understands what the numbers are. Um, so just reading a financial statement is really difficult for some people and gleaning what's important. But when you use the charts and you use the the infographics, um, you're really pulling in kind of what those important metrics are. What are the things that people should be focusing on and using that to tell your story? It's when it's eye catching, people are going to tune in. Um, when they see that, you can use various colors, you know, color it with the organization's logo colors um, and really kind of make it pop for people. Um, but just to draw that attention in and they'll read a little bit deeper um, when they see that. You know, when we talk about this, Angela, everything that you're saying makes abundant sense. But let's drill down a little bit to how this gets constructed because not to bash the financial department, but I don't see them as being strong in the narrative side of things as maybe somebody coming in from the grants department mm -hmm. or fundraising or just somewhere else in the C-suite. Do we align with these other departments or other folks in our, in our teams oh, to yeah. get 
get something written so that we can actually communicate what we need to? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, collaboration is obviously very important. So, you know, accountants are numbers people, but we, we can write a good sentence. We might not be able to know, you know, spin a, a really good yarn, but we also need data from other components, um, you know, within the organization. So there definitely needs to be collaboration. And depending upon who you're writing the story for, you know, is going to inform, you know, who you're going to rely on as far as that information. Um, so I would say definitely you're going to rely on your folks in, in the development and others in the C-suite kind of as you're going through. You also want to make sure that it rings true. Um, transparency is another thing that's really important when we're telling our story. So you want to fact check everything that you're putting out there. And that, you know, again, you're going to talk to other people within the organizations. Let them read it. Make sure it rings true for them. Uh, make sure also it has that, you know, that high personal touch. Um, so that everybody is involved in that process as well. You know, not not all organizations are blessed with a marketing and communications department, but I would imagine if you have that or you have a consultant or somebody that works part time, mm -hmm. that's got to be the person that is like the keeper of the keys, right? That there's there's standard phraseology there. To your point, I love what you said. Um, that the metrics are consistent, you know, the, the sample dates are consistent, that we're drawing upon um, impact numbers and situations and narrative that are held consistently throughout all phases of our organization. And I know we'll get into where we put our information in just a minute, mm -hmm. but um, it but seems to me you got to back up. Yeah, you do, because you do have you, you have to start with good information um, again know what the story is that you want to tell before you start writing it understand what it is that you need to communicate to your audience and that that starts with the metrics that starts with the numbers we're we're, we're telling a financial story so obviously we have to start with the numbers um but when we get into that marketing aspect another you know another person that you might need to rely on is maybe there's a board member who has some background um, in that marketing or communications that can help you um, to also kind of check on that phrasing um, and review the information. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that's really smart because if you get, if you, if you do all this work and then it falls flat or you haven't tested it or it doesn't communicate what you thought it was communicating, mm -hmm. um, then yeah, that's, that would be just a real bummer. Okay. We, you, you mentioned this earlier and, and I think this is really interesting because where we tell our story matters. Um, help us to understand this, Angela. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a, there's a variety of different places that we can tell the story of the organization. And one of the things we have to be mindful, and I'll go through each one of them, but one of the things we have to be mindful is that there's a different audience um, you know, for each one of these things, the, the person who's reading your audited financial statement is probably a banker that you're trying to get a loan from or a funder that you're trying to get grant funding from. You know, your internal financial statements are going to be read by your board. Um, you know, they know the organization. They know your mission. So what you're telling them is a little bit different. Um, so you really have to understand who your audience is and then target your message to that particular audience but always remembering um, that your message should stay the same. You know, you're communicating the same numbers and the same outcomes. Um, you don't want there to be any inconsistencies in the messages that you're putting out there because that erodes trust. And really what we're trying to do here is build trust through transparency. So you don't want to erode that by um, putting out inconsistent information. Right. It seems to me, too, Angela, that you want everybody rowing in the same direction. And if mm -hmm. our board members and our C-suite um, are repeating the same numbers or the same facts or the same figures, that that goes to what you just said beautifully, building community trust mm -hmm. and not eroding it. Yep, we don't, exactly. We don't talk about that enough. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, with the internal financial statements, the audited financial statement, the board reviews them, but giving the board that story so that they can reiterate it out in the community has huge impact. So, you know, it's, it's not just the organization telling its story, but it's the board telling its story. It's, you know, the funders that you meet with, it's the community partners 
um, that you're working with. And if they all know what that story is because you've told it to them multiple times in different mm -hmm. ways, but they're getting the same message, they can carry that message on for you. Yeah. You know, we, you talk about the audited financials, internal financials, the 990. I've always been told or taught that the 990 should be looked at. It's an IRS form that we, we do every year, should be thought of as a brochure, which I think is a fascinating thing. What do you think about that? Absolutely. It's definitely a marketing tool for the organization. Um, you have to remember the Form 990 is a public document, so anybody can get their hands on it. So again, you're probably sending it to your funders, but anyone who's looking to um, gain more information about an organization or figure out where they want to spend their contributions, they have access to it. So why not use it for all that it's worth? There's, there's a lot of information that goes in there, but the organization has an ability to really define their mission right at the front of the document. Um, you know, on the second page, they can go through all of the program descriptions. So go through all of your significant programs and really do a deep dive um, a real good, complete description of those programs, what the benefits are, what the outcomes are, um, you know, so people can really understand what's the impact if they're giving to this organization, you know, what's the impact on the community? Yeah, I think that's something that is so overlooked. And I appreciate you highlighting that because um, it seems to me that it's just a wasted opportunity for so many organizations. Um, mm -hmm and they don't realize the value of it. And I loved what you said, first and foremost, it's a public document. Right. So right. it's accessed it's, without you ever knowing. Yeah, exactly, it's out there and people are looking at it and they're kind of judging your organization based on what they see in that Form 990. So really, you know, diving deep, um, some of that same information is gonna go into your um, audited financial statement but that's not really a public document. Like unless you put it out there on your website, nobody's really going to see it um, other than the people that you specifically give it to. But you can go into that same level of detail describing your programs in that audited financial statement. But again, the Form 990 is public. Anybody can pick it up and look at it. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> so then we go on to like the annual report and the website. Again, it seems to me we do this work once in some ways. We might need to manipulate it a little bit. But this information, once we've um, navigated it, checked it, make sure that it works, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it really can live in a lot of different places. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That annual report, you know, it's, it's, it's generally only done once. So, um, or once a year, I should say, similar to the Form 990 in your annual audit, um, but it should live on your website. People should be able to access it and see it and see kind of what you've done over the past year. Similarly, your website, you know, that you actually have an opportunity to refresh over time, to kind of give a fresh story, you know, from time to time or let them live on your website because, you know, we live in a in a Google environment, everybody is researching whatever is on their mind. So people can very easily get to your website and you want it to be something that's dynamic, something that, again, is inviting, um, you know, use the visualizations, um, but tell your story there so that people will want to come back, want to give to the organization and know exactly what you're doing. Um, the annual report, the Form 990, the um, the audit financial statements. Again, they're annual documents, so you do want to review them, you know, on an annual basis. Don't let that information be evergreen. You want to refresh. Make sure that you're telling a current story that will keep people engaged. So um, make sure you're, um, you know, refreshing and updating that information each year. I love that you said that because things change. We change our programming. We mm -hmm. absorb other programs. We let things go. We might solve problems and then we sunset something. Okay. Um, so I, I appreciate you kind of uh, highlighting that. Um, I want to ask another question and it might seem a little odd, but do you ever feel like there's an opportunity to have like information overload that if should we say, <laughs> okay, we're going to pick the five most important points or the three most or the 30 most, like how can yeah. you guide us so that we can understand what that yeah. is? 
that's actually one of my points when we get to the pitfalls is, is you know, data overload. We don't want to overload okay. people with too much information. Um, and again, especially, you know, depending upon the source of the information, um, social media is a great point for this because you can, you know, just put in little capsules and nuggets of information and send it out. Um, and you can do the same thing on your website as well. But defining what those really key metrics are for the organization to hone in on what the story is. So, you know, if it's revenue growth, if it's, you know, the number of people that you served, um, if it's a new program that you're offering and you want to tell people about the great benefits, you know, again, just hone in on what that specific particular story is that you want to tell and then give some very precise information on, again, how you're using those financial resources, what you expect to do in the future, what the impact is to the beneficiaries of your organization. Um, again, those personal stories make a really big impact here. It's an interesting thing, Angela, because I've got to believe too that over the course of time, um, the more we learn as, as somebody serving uh, on a board or in the C-suite or even a funder or even a client, uh, the more that we understand an organization, it seems like then we can start to build on that and take on additional information. Mm -hmm. How often um, should we be changing this or presenting information? Is it like come up with your story for the whole year and stick to it or leak it out every quarter like how do we manip i don't use the word manipulate but no, how do we engage out yeah that that is really important again those first things i talked about your audit your 990 the annual report those are annual things so you're only getting one opportunity with those to tell the story of the past year what you really want to do is use your website, use your social media to tell the current story. And, you know, if it's a monthly thing, if it's a quarterly thing, you know, depending upon, again, whether you have a marketing department, you know, um, if you have somebody else who can help you to craft that message to get it out there. Um, but engaging with your constituents, engaging with, you know, your donors and your funders on an ongoing basis is really important. It can't just be kind of that once a year um, I'm going to tell them my story. And then, you know, um, the other thing we didn't talk about is, you know, the annual giving. You're you're doing that annual solicitation. You want to tell a different story when you're sending that out versus what you've told, you know, the other times that they've seen you during the year. So um, you want to be creative um, and, you know, figure out what what it, what is that story? What, you know, continually. And th this is where you're really tapping into others within the organization. Um, because yes, it's finance related, but it's impact. So what are we doing that's impacting others that we can, you know, we can share that message. Mm -hmm. You know, in your illustrious career, and as you go across this country, talk with nonprofits, talk with your, your teams about this, what are some of the rubs? Like is, is, a is this a, a really a heavy lift for the finance department or are they going to welcome this? Or because sometimes I feel like the finance team doesn't always get the respect that it deserves from the other departments. There's fear. There's an inability to communicate sometimes. And mm -hmm. there's and people are fearful about money. And that's like a whole nother topic. Right. But how do we get everybody, as I like to say, rowing in the same direction on this? Yeah. I mean, you you have to be a team player and you have to recognize, you know, everybody is doing what they can for the benefit of the organization. We're here, all here to support the mission of the organization. And so we all have a part to play. Um, you know, the accountants and, and the finance team, we are pulling the numbers together, but we're also, you know, we're not just reporting the numbers, we're helping management understand what those numbers mean and what impacts they have. So right there, we're, you know, it's already part of our job to tell a story. Even if we're just telling the story to the executive director, we're interpreting what those financials mean and what impacts they have for the organization. So kind of taking it beyond that management team, is just kind of a natural progression, yeah. but you do need, um, like you said, everybody rowing in the same direction. So, you know, collaboration with other departments um, is just something on an ongoing basis that we have to do in finance because we can't, um, you know, we can't go it alone. We can't just be in silos. Um, those are some of the things that 
prevent nonprofits from being the best that they can be. When people are just working in silos and just worrying about what they need to do, everybody needs to be working together to support the mission of the organization. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good reminder. We don't have a lot of time left, um, but I want to get into something that uh, maybe is a somewhat controversial, and that is like forecasting. Now, let's be honest, in the last five to eight years, forecasting has been really jumbled up because <laughs> of COVID and, and so many other things going on, right? But do we or should we be using these same tools for forecasting? I feel like, Angela, that that the sector is now calming down a little bit and, mm -hmm. and starting to think more forward. What are you seeing in the, along those lines in terms of forecasting and, and using storytelling? Uh, so, you know, obviously forecasting is important. Um, regardless of what's going on um, in the world, we need to know um, organizationally where we're headed and we need to make um, decisions based on where we've been and where we think we're going. So forecasting, you know, is a part of accounting and a part of a nonprofit process that will never, um, will really never go away. Um, it's something very important, but as we tell the story of where we think we're going and what we need, um, I mean, that's an important part of the storytelling as it relates to the forecasting, because the forecasting is is the organization determining what, what are their needs going to be and what can they do um, within their mission, and then using that storytelling to kind of cast a net out as far as what what do we need from our funders, from our community um, to get the job done? Mm -hmm. um, just real quickly, I got an email the other day from an organization and they were so transparent in this communication that I just loved it. They um, had a fundraising goal and they didn't meet their goal. And they came back um, in their reporting and said, hey, we didn't meet our goal. We tried really hard. We appreciate everybody that donated, um, but we're not stopping here. Here's what we're gonna do with the funds that we raised. We're going to put some aside. Um, and then, you know, basically they had the call to action to, you know, get people to continue to donate so that they could reach the goal because what they needed was really important. And they told the story of why it was important. Um, so mm -hmm. it's always important to kind of have that future focus in your storytelling as well, because there's always going to be needs. I love that you shared that story with us. Thank you. Because absolutely, you just demonstrated beautifully about it's not just we need more money, it's why mm -hmm. and what we're going to do and what's the stewardship aspect of that of that narrative. I love that you shared that. Thank you. Um, do you know how they're doing? I think they're doing pretty well. I think uh -huh. they're doing pretty well. I haven't I haven't gotten another report out, but that email just came a couple of weeks ago. So I'm uh -huh. hoping that it did spur people to dig a little deeper yeah. um, and help them reach their goal because it's important. Yeah, I love it. Good for them. You know, a lot of times we don't see that. It's just kind of like whimpers off and it dies a painfully slow death. And uh, so I really appreciate that. Good for them. You'll have to um, you'll have to keep your eye on that and let me know what, what happens, because I think that's really powerful. I really, really do. Well, you, my friend, are super powerful and it is always a joy to be able to spend any amount of time with you. Angela Coxum regional director at your part-time controller and you can learn more about angela and the team you have nearly 800 folks now working for your part-time controller and you can meet them and learn about their work at yptc.com and uh, you can learn about where they serve how they serve uh, the other thing that's really interesting is that yptc has a lot of additional information white papers, videos, webinars. Mm -hmm. um, you can even find uh, back uh, episodes of, of the nonprofit show. Um, but it's really fun because this information is not what we call gated. So you can get to this information, whether you're a client of theirs or not, which is pretty powerful because most people don't do that. <laughs> they, they keep it a little secret, but uh, my, PC, my PTC does not do that yeah. you share yeah our goal is to help nonprofits even if you're not a client the information is there and available yeah it really is cool it's it's amazing and um as i said at the start of this, this episode 
you know, there's, it's a judgment free zone, no hair on fire moments, no eye rolling. <laughs> um, and so it really is, uh, I think it can build your confidence too, because, you know, Angela, when you're armed with a little bit of information, then I think you can engage in this financial discussion more, mm -hmm. more readily, right? You're not so fearful and uh, then everybody can be at the table. And I think that's really, really an important thing. Um, again, Angela, thank you for your brilliance. As always, I learn something from you every time. And it, it's a, a lot of fun to be able to share this time with you. Hey, another thing that's really important to us at the Nonprofit Show are our amazing partners. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These folks row with us every day in the same direction, and we are ever so grateful. Okay, Angela, I'm going to say get back there and, and do better and more work for our nonprofit sector. We're counting on you. Thanks, Julia. It's been a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, we end each and every episode of the nonprofit show with this message. And today we're really thinking about all of our family and friends and citizens in the South. When we started Friday's episode, there were eight people that had passed away due to this um, terrible storm, Helene. And now as we go on air, there are over, I believe, 108. Um, and so it was really a shocking loss of life. And this is when our nonprofits are called into action. And so we leave with this message and it goes like this, to stay well, so you can do well. Thank you, everyone.